there in the midst. My, my God, can we lift our hands right now? Lord, I don't want to move on past this right now. I know you are wanting to do something mighty. So God, I don't want to skip over it. God, I don't want to move on past it. So Jesus, as you sweep through this place, as you continue to move through these pews, God sweeping all the way across from the front to the back, left to the right, you are moving in this place. And God, you are allowing chains to be falling off. But God, help us not to pick them back up and tie them back onto us. But God, let you take over. God, let you sever the ties. Hallelujah. My God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to move right into what I, I feel God has got for this service tonight. Uh, you can make your way back to your seats. You may be seated, by the way. God is so real. He's more than a name in a book. He's more than a moving on your spine. He's so much more and so much deeper than anything our minds can comprehend. So tonight, I want to start off by, I don't even have a title. I was trying to come up with one. I'm like, you know what? It's got to be great. It's got to be brilliant. People got to look at that and be like, that's a title. And I'm like, Lord, I, I, I've got a bunch of them. But if, this, if I had to title this one, it would be, do you see me? You're welcome upstairs. Starting this, this lesson off, I, 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 I felt like God crucify me just just crucify me get it over and done with just crucify me and I started thinking about it I'm like no no I don't want I don't want to die and I, I've talked about a lesson in in re telling God to search me okay well if you're not going to crucify me just search me first just search me like, but but not too close don't don't search me too close <laughs> search me from over there. TSA, I have nothing on me. Can't you tell from across the room? The problem is they can't. They have to get close. And so <laughs> search me, but not too close. There's too many, God, I've got too many imperfections. God, I've got too many things wrong with me. Sometimes we already know what needs to go. We don't need God to search us. We've got a brain. We know we're supposed to let go of some things. We know there are things that we're not supposed to be holding on to. But we want somebody else to do the work for us. Right. Search me, God. I already did. I gave you a brain. And now you can search yourself. And then we say, crucify me, God. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that we say that I don't know if you really know what it means. It says we are supposed to crucify ourselves daily. And I was thinking, even if it's not about killing me, crucifying me, sometimes he's wanting to kill some things, sever some ties. And if we say, I'm vulnerable, Whatever I don't need, God cut it off. Again, that's us stepping away from, we know what we're supposed to let go of, but we want God to do it. So when we say, God, take, take whatever, I'm being serious, take whatever I don't need away from me. And God starts cutting. Wait! I need that. I, that was a blessing before. That was needed before. I like that part of me. I want to hold on to it. It's a part of me. Then God's like, that's the problem. 
we are made overcomers by the word of our testimony. And I started thinking, these are, these are all things that I, I've been going over. Made overcomers by, I'm going somewhere, I promise. These are, these are all things that we, we say. We're made overcomers by the word of our testimony. But my testimony isn't as cool as Brother Jason's. My testimony's not as cool and as elaborate as Pastor Betcher's. We're not supposed to make up a testimony. Well, if I had one as cool, if I had been as crazy as that person, man, people would listen to me. Your testimony is your testimony. We are made overcomers by the word of our testimony. Only some of you. And, but some, sometimes that's how we, how we perceive it. God is saying your testimony can bring deliverance. Your testimony can bring healing to someone who's in the exact same situation that you are in. You don't know who is sitting next to you. You don't know what they're going through. Your testimony may be the very thing that can bring that deliverance and hope into their life. Don't be envious of someone else's testimony. It's not a made-up testimony. This isn't a testimony contest. Sometimes we look at our testimony in our, our lives and we're like, man, I messed up big time. And I, I was not born and raised in Pentecost. I didn't have all of these things but yet at the same time, we don't realize how very much needed every part of our testimony is into the shaping of our character. Somebody hear me tonight? In the shaping of how we conduct ourselves. The trials that you go through, you will pick something up from there that will be crucial later on in life. Going back, this is, this is an iceberg. I, I'm telling you, I'm all over the place, and I'm hoping at the end to pull it back together. This is an iceberg. This is an iceberg. <laughs> and I started breaking down, sorry. I started breaking down reality. This is, our, this is our theme for 2019, reality. You look at the top of the iceberg, and I'm sure if you look on Google, you can find a bunch of, I found out about Dave Ramsey. Brother Course Garden, thank you so much. Dave Ramsey used an iceberg. And he said, this is the perception. And then he got debt and he got all this stuff underneath. And they said, it's all crazy. And I started thinking, anybody can use an iceberg and, and put something else on it. But breaking it down is the iceberg is what we want people to see. The iceberg, the top part, the part that's floating above the water, we want that to be the prettiest. We want that to be the nicest and so put together. But who are you really? Oh, my testimony. Let me tell you chapter four of my testimony. Because it's a good one. Chapter one, two, and three, eh. Chapter four is a good part of my testimony. And so we put out there what we, what we want people to perceive us as. But there's so much more. There's so much beneath the surface I started realizing that an iceberg, some of them, there was different breakdowns of how big an iceberg actually is. Some of them said between 87% is below the surface of the water. Some of them said up to 91 point some odd, and they gave this crazy equation. So I just say 91% of the surface is below, or I'm sorry, the, of the iceberg is below the surface of the water. And I... I started talking to Reed. I'm like, you know, my mind goes everywhere. My mind, it goes crazy sometimes. And I, I started thinking, I was like, you know, for that iceberg to gain 1% above the water, it would need to gain 10% total. So for 1% to be added on what everyone perceives, there's 9% that has just been added in the depth and into the core of this iceberg. And I'm like, okay, okay. So where, God, where do you want me to go with that? 1% of an addition to how we are perceived by people 
is only created by 9% that is not created or not visible. An iceberg that wants to reject weight won't rise higher. I know some of you guys, this is, this is new news. But an iceberg has to gain that 10% to gain 1% above the, the surface of the water. I'm reiterating this just to make sure I drive this home. Um, the amount of power in any person is connected to the amount of suffering. So we say, who is the most powerful man in the world? Jesus. What kind of pain and suffering did he endure? So who are we to say everything that comes our way has got to be above the surface of the water, has to be what everyone can see, it has to be blessings. We want blessings to come at us like a magnet. Oh, here's, here's a blank check. Here, do whatever you want to with a blank check. You know, I was like, oh, wow. Oh, a new car. Thanks, Brayden. And we, we want these blessings to come at us. But the negativity, what happens when those circumstances seem to, to just come in like a flood and bombard us? What happens? Do we jump at it and be like, ooh, give me more of that? Pain and frustration, give me more. Can I have seconds, please? No, we don't. Acts 1 and 8 says, but ye shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. We have got to be transparent to the world. We have got to be a, a, a book to the world. I, I mentioned our testimonies. We can say chapters 1, 2, 5, 12. We can, we can try to, to skip over our lives as if every part of it is not important. But God has placed us in this earth. As I mentioned, even in prayer, God has placed us here for a purpose. God has a purpose for every single one of us in this place. But you don't understand my past. It's a crazy one. Those are usually the best testimonies. I could pull up a chair and listen to some testimonies. And I'm like, but mine, I was just born and raised in Pentecost all my life. <sighs> There's no drugs in my background, so I can't, I can't jump on that and be like, me and pastor. Back in the day. I can't, I can't tag on to someone else's testimony, even, it, even though it seems it, he is victorious. He is a conqueror. He has overcome these things. This is powerful. I was just born and raised in church. But I promise you, I've got a testimony. Amen. Be a life that shines the light of God. Whatever your testimony. Be a light, a continuous light. Matthew 5, 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You represent God. Yes. Crazy circumstances or not. You've got to live God's word. You've got to let it shine by letting it permeate through you. You are a living, breathing letter or a, a book read by men. Are they reading you correctly? Are they reading you right? I mean, I know what I meant. Are they reading you right? When we are born again, we talk different. We live different. And our book, our life, our testimony, the way we conduct ourselves needs to reflect that change. The things we used to do, we don't do them any longer. We walk in newness of life. The things that appealed to us before no longer should appeal to you. We want to cut out, cut out and rip out chapters of our, of our life because if we messed up, it's just a fault and we just want to destroy it. We want to forget 
the mistakes we've made. But we have to remember the victories that we gained because of those failures help to build our character. They give us wisdom in moving forward. They give someone else the strength to continue to move forward. It gives them hope at a dead end. It gives them light at the end of the tunnel. It gives them motivation to continue on. This very same testimony that we may have can give a surge of energy to someone to move forward even though they are tired they could be at the end of their rope they could they could be so tired of fighting and i'm just faking it i'm just going through the motions and and you may have the very thing that can give them the motivation to say you know what if he he can do it then I know I can do it. If my brother or sister in Christ can do it, then God help me, I'm going. They've been where I've been. They've been through what I am going through. My God, they, there are people here in this place that share your same situation. But if they aren't able to let it go, to let it out of their mouth, to let that testimony bring healing, someone could walk away. In a world that seems so caught up in themselves and looking on Instagram and there's songs about selfies and, the, and Facebook and you got uh, Snapchat and you got all these different things. And I started thinking, it's just, hey, let me even like Twitter, let me put out my information out there because I'm, I'm a book writer. Let me type whatever I want to say and just publish it. And it's, it's, there's a lot of things going on about self. I was going somewhere, I promise. A lot of things about self, but we don't want to taint our image. We don't want to, we don't, oh, I don't want nobody to look at me like, oh, he messed up. It's not one of those cool past testimonies. We are to give our everything and to look back, not idolizing where we've been, but to say, look, I was, I'm, a, I'm ashamed of what I did, but look what God did in that situation. Do you see, did you see God's hand in that situation? Yeah. King David. King David's son was sick. So King David fasted and he laid all night on the ground. The elders came to him. They tried getting him up, but he wouldn't get up and he wouldn't eat with them. The seventh day, as his child was sick, his servants were tending to his child and they came back and they're all trying to get him to eat, trying to get him to, to get off the ground. And David saw that his servants were whispering, and this is on the seventh day, and, and David perceived that his child had died. And so he said, hey, is my child dead? And they said, yes. This has always gotten me. I, I, it's in 2 Samuel 12 and 20. This always gets to me, because I'm like, did David not care about his kid? In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20, it says, Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came into his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Verse 21, Then he said, then said his servants unto him, What thing is this thou, that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst arise, did rise and eat bread. It wasn't that he stopped caring for the child. It wasn't that with the child being dead and gone, he just became bitter and hard and just moved on with life. He went into to worship God. He shut out his desires, his hurts, his longings for his son to be alive, and he took on God's. What is God's desire? 
when he talked, when the, when the, when Nathan was talking to him, he said, because of your sin, your son's going to die. And yet David's like, you know, I was trying to find God's mercy. I was trying to, uh, trying to feel after he said, who can tell whether God be, will be gracious to me that my child may live. He didn't continue to, to, to block it all out. He said, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to plug in to see if God will be gracious that my child may live. But when God had taken his child's life and kept his word, David said, you know what? I'm not crying over spilt milk. I'm going to worship. I'm going to move on with my life. I can't just worry about the things that happened in my past, the things that messed up, the things that I really want. Lord, crucify me. And God's like, all right, I'm I'm going to work on perfecting you. But God, I I really wanted to look at Abraham putting Isaac on the altar. God's saying, do you love me or is it circumstantial? With the iceberg, all of the things, all of the scars, all of the the divots in it, all of the, the, the things that don't help the iceberg, it can affect how it moves, how it floats. Everything that happens below the surface can determine how much higher the iceberg rises or lowers. Too often we want to limit, I, I don't want anything bad to happen in my life whatsoever. I don't want, I'm going to stay in my little bubble and I'm going to receive, open the door for only blessings. David never would have defeated Goliath if it hadn't been for the lion and the bear. He had to defeat those. Those weren't the end result. Those were, those were practice. That was getting him conditioned. There's a, there's a lot of rumors about how big David actually was. But it doesn't matter. He fought a lion and a bear. I wouldn't fight him. But my thoughts are, I bet, I bet he got cut. David, he, he may have been incredibly talented and masculine, or maybe he was just so agile he could just sneak in. Whatever the case is, I guarantee you, he didn't leave out of there unscathed. He had some cuts. He had some hurts. He had, he, maybe he got a, a paper cut or something. Whatever the case is, I'm sure there was something that he took from that. I, I, got, I fought a lion. How, whatever. Okay, yeah, I'm missing half of my hand. There is proof of your circumstances. There are things that have changed you. Sometimes scars become stronger. Sometimes the things that we are a part of that we are, don't want to be a part of. God, this trial, this tribulation, take it away from me. And God's saying, you need it. You need as much weight as you can handle to lift you higher. You need another 9%. You need that 9% below the surface that no one else can see to help elevate you one more percent. Do you see me? Or are you looking at the only, the portrayal of me that I want you to see? We try getting a taste, looking back over our book, our our book of life, our book of our testimony. We want to skip ahead. We want to look at chapter 95 and 98 and say, what cool things are in store for me there? And can I get a sneak peek? I want to look at them, and I want to grab whatever I can. Oh, I'm going to be a missionary to Ghana? And God's like, well, if I told you that, you would bypass all of these other things that you need, all the tools needed to get to that point. Don't jump ahead. Work with where you're at. 
Okay, some of you guys don't understand the books. Video games. You can't jump ahead to the boss if you don't pick up the tools needed from level four. Do they do levels anymore? Sorry. Older video games is what I meant to say. Older video games, they had levels and you would need to pick up a trait or a skill set in the earlier ones because when you got to the end, I'm going to fight a boss and I don't have the equipment needed. So now you got to double up. You have to go back and start over to find out where did you miss it. You don't know where you missed it because you skipped ahead. Don't skip ahead. Sometimes it takes time. And sometimes time is the one thing that we hate to give. I don't have time. Can I borrow some of your time? Time. God wants to teach us patience. I promise he wants to teach every single one of us patience. Ask him. In our book, when we look at all of our levels and all of our challenges and all these things that are placed before us, in our book, I'm here to tell you our author always has an escape. The one that created all things, the God of heaven and earth, the one that is watching over us, he has always made it to where we can get out. We're not to the point where we're like, I have no other option. God's like, look, turn around. Sometimes you have to go back to the previous chapter and pick up something. But God's working on it. He turns our mourning into dancing. I just learned it's M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. I'm just kidding, I knew that already. Our mourning, our sorrows into joy. Not our early morning breakfast, lunch, dinner. Not our mourning into dancing. Sometimes God wants you to dance all day, not just in the morning. And our sackcloth and our sorrows, clothed, he clothed us with joy. So we can know someone. I'm moving ahead. Our, our, do, you, do you really see me for me? Or are you looking at the portrayal I want you to see? We can know someone. Or we can't know someone unless God speaks to us about them. So we have to be careful how we speak to them. Oh, I've seen the way these people, actually, let me tell you about going into a restaurant. How many of you seen younger people always on their phone or older people always on their phone? And I'm like, how can you just sit there on your phone when somebody's right across from you and you start judging? And then my wife and I, we were, we were eating at Egg Harbor, and we're like, all right, so we got to take care of this. Yeah, all right. And then so I was thinking, if somebody else is watching me, then I'm going to be that young person that they're like, can they just get off their phone? <laughs> they're sitting right across from them. So I was like, every so often, I was like, uh, uh, Kiara, so just to make sure that we're on the same page in case anybody's watching, all right, yeah, going back to my phone. <laughs> just to justify, yes, we are communicating. You don't know what people are doing. You don't know if they're checking their email or they're playing a game. You don't know. But we're so quick to judge. We're so quick to say, that person, I see how they are walking into this place. I see what they are wearing. I see things. So they don't, re they don't really want truth. I'm here to tell you right now. Some people may not have the training. They may not have been raised in church. You don't come to church wearing that. You don't talk to people like that. God knows the intents of people's heart. God knows where people have been raised. God knows everything about them. So who are we to judge? We make mistakes. We are human. We make mistakes. And we truly repent. We truly, God, I will not go back. I will not do them again. And we, we can let them 
be chapters, like we have a secret tunnel or secret passage going back to that chapter because we can just look in it all the time. But God's saying those chapters, let them be your past chapters. Let God author a new page for you every day, every day. So we can move past it. We don't have to let yesterday hold us down. We can use the testimony to propel us into the new chapters and into the new pages God has yet to orchestrate for your life. There is so much more. Sometimes you just got to let go. David had to move on. He loved his son. He loved his son. And he pleaded with God for his life. And then once it was all said and done, he said, all right, I've got to, God, I worship you. Job said, though you slay me, yet will I serve you. I don't need to worship you based off of my circumstances. Everything's going great, God, I'm all yours. Everything's going terrible. Where was you? God is still the same God in the good times when everything's going perfect. When everything is going perfectly fine, God is still the same God as when everything seems to be crashing down. I don't, I don't know where my shoes went. I'm wearing mismatched shoes. I don't have a pair of socks that don't have holes in them. I do. I apologize. My wife, yes, thank you for keeping me with great socks. But I'm saying if I had socks with only holes in them, God is still very real. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on blast out like that. I have good socks. We have to be a witness. Good, bad, up, down, left, right. Everything that we are a part of, we must be a witness. You have to shine your light by living God's word and share it. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. I started looking at the iceberg. Where'd my iceberg go? I was looking at my iceberg. And we, we, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Correct. And it, we want the iceberg to be just perfect and high above the water so everyone can see us. But I started realizing a good name within itself is pride. If all you've got, I just got to hold this up. I got to hold this up. Everything else is falling apart. Everything, the, my whole life is, is in shambles. Everything is going, if I'm, I'm just going to keep a good name. Everything's going perfectly fine, guys. I'm good. And then when you go back home, you've got nothing. There's a, there's a difference between saying, I'm so, woe is me. Everything's the worst. And there's, there's, a, there's an opportunity to be able to say, you know what? God is good. God is real. God is awesome. But we, don't, we want to hold ourselves up and say, I've got everything all figured out. Sometimes that is what's hiding your deliverance. That can be the one thing that is stopping you from reaching out saying, I, I need something. God, I need something more. If we're too busy stuck within ourselves, I've got it. I've been here before. God, I have prayed and I've touched you. And so now the rest of my life should be easy. Newsflash, it's not. We need our brothers and sisters. We need our, 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 our leaders, our helpers, our parents. We need, them. It, they say it takes a city to raise a child. I'll let you, I'll leave that there. So moving on to, to Matthew 23. No, I'm gonna go back. It takes a city to raise a child. Too often we wanna isolate ourselves. We want somebody to watch over our backs, but then we tell them to get off our backs. We need somebody to tell us where to go, but don't tell me where to go. We want help, we don't want help. And I started, I started asking God, I'm like, why? Why does, it, why does it seem like some people will walk away from you? Why does it seem like God, people will just fall and, and to go crazy off the deep end? Why, why does this stuff happen? And so I started looking at this and said, because their 10% we saw didn't match their 
of who they really were. We didn't see the crying out to be noticed. We didn't see the screaming out to be loved. Nobody was there when they questioned their very existence. Nobody noticed them dying inside because their 10% had to appear to be spotless. Oh, okay, so that's all about the person on the outside. Flip it around. They didn't want anyone to see their imperfections. Everything's fine. Leave me alone. I'm good. I've got it all figured out when I'm dying inside. I'm good. I don't need your help, even though you're looking out for my soul. I care. I care about you, and I'm, I'm wanting to go. I'm wanting to fellowship with you. I'm wanting to talk to you, but not give you any part of me because I, I'm ashamed of who I am, who I literally am. Not who I was, who I am. But to be able to be vulnerable and say, hey, I messed up. I, I need help. If I go to a doctor and my foot's bleeding, and I'm like, oh, yeah, my, my arms are great. My, my neck, it moves around a lot. The things, hey, look, look over here. This works fine. While this is hurting and this is going to kill me. Don't let the things that, you are, that are killing you, don't let them be the one thing you won't let anyone look at. If somebody wants to help you in the one place that you are hurting, my God. Moving on. They thought the church was like the world and would judge and talk, not help. I'm still talking about that, the, the person that's got the problem. They're assuming they, that they were alone and nobody understood them. And just knowing that they were the only ones who struggled with the things that they struggle with. This is what's, what typically, as I was, I was praying over this, I was, I'm like, yes, the 90% doesn't match the 10. Got it. Why? How? What do we do about it? And it, and it came back if they don't want to be helped, you can't help them. So I, I, you know me, I always have to add some kind of weird humor to it. And so I, ta I started talking about Babyberg. You got Iceberg, you got Babyberg, and you got Mamaberg. <laughs> and Mamaberg wants to take care of baby Berg and wants to pray over baby Berg and wants to protect baby Berg, applying God's anointing over baby Berg's life. But there are things that Mama Berg doesn't know about that she can't provide help for if she doesn't know exists as she's trying to protect. And the way I broke this down, it may, be, it may be so basic and so childish, I guess. <laughs> I've been told before, I'm kind of childish at times. But I started thinking, for this iceberg to float, Mama Berg's pouring this oil, trying to, trying to protect it, trying to keep it safe. And if Baby Berg was to branch off on its own, it would sink. Because the things that Mama Berg was trying to do is say, hey, you, this is dead weight. Get rid of this. All right, so here's, you don't need that. And trying to keep it afloat, we've seen icebergs disconnect from their parents and drop. A little bit of freedom and they drop. A little bit of liberty. And I'm on my own, bam, and they drop. Why? because they didn't know how to use their faults to lift them higher. Instead, their faults were just that. They were faults and dead weight, and they would pull them down. But if you allow God to wrap you up, if you allow God to provide his healing virtue over baby Berg and to be able to allow every part of that iceberg, I'm, yes, I'm pulling icebergs and making it who you are, the iceberg it can be lifted up higher by allowing God to provide that corrective help. This is what happens in Re, guys. I come up with great analogies. Baby Berg, Mama Berg, and they can't help themselves, so then what do they do? 
They go to Lederberg. Lederberg can't help out in everywhere that nobody tells them about. Think about that one a couple times. Again, it goes back to the same thing. I want you to help me. All right, now where do you need help? Help me. Okay. Where do you need help? I need help. There's got to be a place of vulnerability. There has to be a place where we can finally, we, I always do this illustration of opening up my heart, saying, God, look at every part. Search me, not from across the room. God, you get, it. You get a flashlight. You look at every part of me. I have got to be spotless because I don't want anything pulling me down. I don't want the 90% of, of who I am to be a fraud or to be a phony and pulling me under. Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, uh, chapter 23, verse 25 through 26. In the message, sorry, this, this probably won't match up there. You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees. Frauds. You burnish the surface, fur, surface of your cups and bowls so they sparkle in the sun while the insides are maggoty with your greed and gluttony. Stupid Pharisee. I apologize if you guys don't use that word at home. Stupid Pharisee, scour the insides and then the gleaming surface will mean something. Verse 25 through, 20, thir, uh, 25 through 26. You're hopeless, you religion, scholars, and Pharisees, frauds. It repeats it. You're like manicured grave plots, grass clipped and the flowers bright, but six feet down, it's all rotting bones and worm-eating flesh. People look at you and think you are saints, but beneath the skin, you're total frauds. I like to read that before I go to bed. <laughs> but a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. But if all you're doing is cleaning the outside of your cup, if all you're doing is fighting to keep that 10% perfect rather than letting it show who you really are and say, I do need help. Pastor, I, I need somebody to help me in this. I don't have the answers. So I need to find a godly example. I need to find someone who is connected. If I can't reach you, God, then I need to find someone who can because my soul is on the line. And I was talking about baby Berg. It's Baby Berg's job to know how to apply God themselves. Mama Berg can apply God all over trying to shape Baby Berg, but Baby Berg has to, I, I gotta come up with something different than Baby Berg now. Every single one of us, we have to know how to apply God ourselves to themselves. You're not gonna be saved on your parents' salvation. You're not going to be saved off of the relationship with God that your grandparents have. It's not grandfathered down. You can pick up ideas and how to get connected with God, but it's got to be personal. This does not mean isolating yourself. Nobody understands me. My parents might be, uh, 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 I'm all alone. This is not about being alone. This is saying you have to know how to reach God on your own. If the hand is part of the body and it keeps trying to hide, keeps trying to run away, I've got an imperfection. I've got an imperfection. And it keeps trying to run away and hide. How can it be better? How can it even fulfill its purpose as part of the body? We all need to come together as one body, as one church, to continue to work with one another, to be strengthened. And when, when we get problems added onto our lives, when we get the frustrations of this world piling in, I'm telling you, with God in the midst of it all, it will continue to lift you higher. Can we all stand in this place?
Do you see me? Or only the portrayal of me that I want you to see? Like the iceberg, it can only go as high as all the weight involved in the bottom. That 90% that you don't see is labor, is working. It is continuing to find that personal relationship with God on your own. If, if we look at the way any leader in church or any, any person that is in any position whatsoever, even in the world, what you see is not everything that they're putting into it. There's so much more. And if the only time that we worship and if the tip of the iceberg is what we want everybody to see and that's the only time that we pray and that's the only time that we, we worship God and the only time we read our Bible is when someone's reading a scripture for a message, God's saying there's, there's so much more. I want, to, I want to communicate with you. I want to give you stability. I want to heal those scars that you are hiding from people. I want to be able to work in your life to take your mourning and turn it into dancing. I want you to be able to rejoice over the things that you are suffering right now. I want you to be able to lift your voice and with a victorious cry instead of weeping. But being transparent and knowing it's not Lederberg, Grandma Berg, Pastor Berg's intentions to sink anyone. They're not going to try and push you underwater unless it's like the lesson that they're trying to teach you something. Love God more than breath. They're not to kill you. Get a job. You don't love me. It's, that's not what it's about. We have to look past the circumstances and say, it's going to be for my good. I've had something similar happen. How will we know? How will we know that our parents may be sharing our same testimony if we don't open up to them? If we don't talk to them? How will we know that we can get help for a situation that just seems so mind boggling unless we open up ourselves? and say, I, I've got this problem. I've got this thing that I've been hiding away. Ashamed of it or not, the only one that can apply healing salve and restoration, he's here tonight. You don't know my, I don't have to know your circumstances. I don't have to know anything about you. I don't, but God does. So as we open up ourselves and say, God, what if, if you're telling me I need to make better friends, make new friends, to listen to my parents, listen to my leaders, I've got to be able to create that connection to where I can be mentored, that I can have someone speak into my life and give me pointers, someone who knows and has been around. I can't solve world hunger by myself. I can't solve all of these problems by myself. But I am going to be able to present everything that I have, everything that I know, all of my frustrations, all the things that, I, that are eating me alive inside. I'm not going to be an iceberg that sinks because I didn't know how to apply God's virtue over my life. I will not let these things that are dead weight pull me down. That's why I need my leaders. That's why I need my parents. That's why I need my pastor to say, you need to cut some ties. You've got to let that go. So tonight, For us to be lifted higher, we've got to make some changes. Not just here. It needs to start here. But the reality is every day. Every day. We say that all the time. What do we do every day? Pray. And I talk to my, my re-members. 
says, what's the reality? Do we pray every day or do we know what the answer to the question is? Do we pray every day? Do we touch God every day? Or do we say a short prayer and say, I did pray today. How can we be led by the Spirit if we can't even tap into the Spirit? So tonight, as we open up these altars, we're giving us a platform right now. We're giving us an opportunity to be able to be vulnerable before God and say, I've got issues. God, I've got issues. And if you've got, if you've got this opportunity right now before, before this whole congregation, we're not asking you to be a put on blast, but to say, God, I need something more from you. I'm not okay. I need something. I'm opening up these altars now. So Lord, with everything that I have, I want to present my life before you. I know what's supposed to be coming next. I know what I'm supposed to do next. But God, search me, not from across the room. I want to be lifted higher, but in the right season. Don't lift me up, God, if it's going to destroy me. God, don't lift me up because I want to be uh, caught. I want to be looked at as though I've got it all together. But God, if I can only do one step at a time, then so be it. Because I've got to have you, Jesus. I've got to have you, Jesus. Lord, for us to reach, to reach you. It can't be based off of my parents' relationship with you. But God, teach me. Teach me, God, to be vulnerable before you. Knowing that you will turn these situations around. Even though I may not have the solution. God, I may not understand it now. You've got it all worked out. I trust you, God. I didn't come to this world with anything, and God, I'm not going to leave with it. So God, all I have is me. The frustrations of life, all the things inside of me. God, all that I have, the confusion, the fear, the chaos, it's yours, God. I've got to give it to you tonight. I'm tired of holding it on, holding on to it. I'm tired of letting it take up space in my life. I'll let it be a past chapter, but I'm moving forward. Let me, God, give me the strength to let go and to grab a hold of your spirit. Grab a hold of your will for my life. God, grab a hold of your love. Grab a hold of who you are, Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. You are good, Jesus. You are mighty, God. I don't have all the answers, God. I don't have all the answers. I can't even act like I've got it all together because I can't last one day without you, Jesus. God, I've got to have that stability and it's not from my own understanding. God, it's, it's by your word. I've got to tie into your word, Jesus, knowing that that is the only thing that is constant. That is the one thing that we can tie into and get our strength. You are our strength, Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus' name. You stood before creation. Eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my 
I saw now to stay.